Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the first Asia Pacific Rail webinar. Uh, my name is Bastian. I am part of the Asia Pacific Rail team. Uh, today, our first session is going to be about managing a crisis, uh, how the railway industry is responding to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, now, before I introduce the panel and the moderator, uh, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, the first one being that the views and the opinions of the panelists are their personal ones. Uh, it might not reflect their respective companies. Uh, secondly, we would like to ask you to uh, ask any questions uh, throughout the session. This can be done at the Q&A button that you can find at the bottom or the top of your Zoom interface. Um, if you do this, our um, panelists and moderator will be able to interact with you, ask them live during the session, um, and that way they can answer it. Um, now, I would like to hand over our, the session to uh, Andrew. Um, he is from Jacobs and he'll be moderating this session. Andrew? Excellent. Thank you very much, Bastian, and welcome to everyone. My name is Andrew Tinge, and I'm the Regional Solutions Director for Strategic Consulting with Jacobs in the Asia Pacific region. And we'll be moderating today's webinar from the front room of my house. So I'm sure we're all settled in to these new working arrangements that we are all have. I'm joined by two people this afternoon who have needed to deal firsthand with the rapidly evolving impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mark Goijan. UIC Passenger Director and UIC World Coordinator and member of the, their COVID-19 task force. And Juan Alfonso, President and CEO of Light Rail Manila. I'll ask each panelist to introduce themselves and their organisations at the beginning of their discussion. Uh, Bastian, if we could move to the next. We have the next hour or so together. And over that time, we'd really love to explore with you the myriad of impacts COVID-19 has had on the rail sector, not only in Asia, but we're also bringing some views from across Europe and other parts of the world. First of all, we'll hear from Mark. After Mark's um, presentation, we'll allow five or so minutes to ask some direct questions um, of, of Mark and I'll be keeping an eye on the on the Q&A to help sort of bring those to Mark's attention. Second then we'll hear from Juan and again we'll have five minutes or so at the end of Juan's presentation to answer some specific questions about his insights and experiences. We'd really like to leave about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for you all to have the chance to ask the panelists questions um, and share some experiences of this um, unprecedented um, event around, the, around Asia. Towards the end, we'll, we'll wrap up with some final observations and thoughts from the, from the panelists. Bastian, if I could have the next slide, please. COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented event and has had unforeseeable implications around the world and the region. I believe that some of our guest uh, participants may be joining us from India and was fascinated to learn from some of our Indian colleagues that for the first time in 160 odd years of operation, Asia's largest passenger rail network, Indian Railways was suspended. It took a global pandemic to bring a rail network of that size and scale to a halt. But what we are also seeing is amazing examples of collaboration and innovation as well. The image on the screen that you see uh, at the moment is an image of an Indian railway carriage that has been temporarily converted into a health facility. So these are ways and means that we are dealing with the crisis that were you know, un you know, not considered or not thought about. So we would love to hear examples of this sort of innovation and collaboration that is occurring to deal with this crisis. So my ask of each of you who have joined us from different parts of the world is to share your experiences and ask questions. There is not a part of the rail sector, whether it's passenger or freight network operations, maintenance or planning that has not been affected by this event. And we have different countries at different stages of responding to this crisis. 
So with that, I'll now hand over to our first speaker, Mark Guijun, um, to walk through his presentation. Over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Bastian, for, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, so I'm Mark Guijun. I'm director, as you said, of the passenger department in the International Union of Railways. I'm also the coordinator of the UIC Latin American region and also the coordinator for the UIC COVID-19 uh, pandemics. Next slide, please. Bastian. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, UIC, only, only to, to, to see uh, some words about, about UIC. Uh, UIC is the association of, the, of railways in the world. Uh, we have around 200 and, uh, members in all the continents and there are some members also in, in the ASEAN part, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and so on. What we're doing is promotion of uh, rail transport in the world with uh, the government, with well undertakings, with infrastructure managers. We are also a technical platform for, for our members to have a rail system vision. And we are carrying out a lot of innovative pro projects for our members, promoting the carbon-free sustainable transport. We organize 85 conferences and congresses per year in all the topics. For passengers, it could be uh, stations, high speed or other topics, ticketing. Uh, cooperation also with the major international institutions like UITP, IATA, uh, United Nations and other institutions. Next slide, please. So at UIC, we have built, uh, we have set up a UIC COVID-19 task force with all our, our members. So we have more than 60 UIC members which have reached the task force. So I've just seen some, some uh, uh, words coming also from, from India. So India is in the task force. But, but there are uh, also uh, members coming from America, from uh, North America, from South America, uh, for Europe, I think uh, quite all countries in Europe and in Asia. Uh, what, what we have done also, what we have performed is we have produced a guidance for railway stakeholders, including potential measures, responses and communication. It is the first document we have, uh, we have produced we are now doing a second document with the actions taken by the task force members. It is ongoing. And we will do a third document concerning the resumption phase to be developed uh, with the task force members. It is for mid-May. We communicate also with all our members through the UIC Extranet. That means that they can have access to all our documents and all the documents coming from, from the members. There are hundreds of documents now here, and there, there are also 70 uh, videos in the media center. Each two weeks, we have a task force uh, meeting. So the next one is this afternoon at one o'clock Paris time for those who are here and we will uh, join it with all, all partners which are here to exchange and to share the best practices. So in Europe, in Middle East, in Asia, Africa, Americas, we will have presentations from, uh, from, uh, from China, from Japan, from Korea, from uh, uh, Europe also uh, this, uh, this afternoon. And you can join also the dedicated UIC LinkedIn group where the address is here on your screen. Next slide, please. What, what we are doing in the actions of, of the, during this task force is first, we know that members have to face uh, short-term issues. They took a lot of measures concerning protection of passengers, protection of staff in contact with passengers, and also staff in offices or maintenance depots. On the basis of questionnaires we have set up a database with all measures taken by our members, like measures in stations, measures in swans, with maintenance and disinfection, how to manage suspected cases. For 
sensitive staff, critical staff, I can say, like for traffic control, uh, some members have divided staff in two teams who never met, who never meet, in order to protect one team if somebody is infected in the other team. So it, it is uh, so, some short-term actions we, we, can, we can share with our members. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, the previous one, because you, 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 you changed the slide, slide before. Okay, thank you very much. Um, what is important also is to ensure the continuity of service in the countries where trends are still running. So our countries where trends are not running, we spoke about India, India is one of these countries, but there are also other countries like Kazakhstan, like Bulgaria, like other countries where there is no more trends running, running in the country. First is to evaluate what are the teams which are available to, um, to carry out, uh, to make the trends and stations. Second, is to follow, of course, the governmental requirements. Then is to set up a transport plan which can move every day according to the situation. So each member have set up a dedicated task force to do that. For passengers, some actions have been applied by the members, like there is no more selling tickets on board. There is no more selling tickets in ticket offices, only by web booking. Also to organize the stations, the wasting zones in stations, and to provide also in stations, hydroalcoholic gel, dispensers, or other, or other things like that. Some members also take the temperature of passengers when they enter the station. And they also um, ask questions to passengers if they are coughing, if, uh, if they have some disease, if they have some problems. And also to organize the seat occupancy on board. For example, for the high speed train where there are uh, reservation tickets, mandatory reservation tickets, only available booking one seat per row. It, uh, it is the case in China and in France, for example. And they have also some protocols for suspected cases. Next slide, please. So I spoke about the uh, short-term actions and now for the medium-term actions, railways have to be prepared to face the situation after the COVID-19 pandemic. First, uh, it is the problem of the postponing uh, of the dates of the licenses and certifications, mainly for drivers uh, certification and also for companies certification. So the, the, first, uh, um, the first issue is to postpone uh, in two steps. First, for domestic traffic with the agreement of the government. Second is for international traffic with agreements between administrations in the concerned countries. Also to adapt the operations and travel process to avoid reinfection. Measures of respecting the distances, mandatory to wear masks, waiting zones, and so on. And maybe we'll speak about that later. Uh, and also manage travel restrictions at borders. Uh, for, for example, at borders, uh, so sometimes people cannot go uh, go, go, go in another country, so we have to change for freight trains drivers at the border. It, it is one example which is given from our members. And also we have, we, when I say we, uh, that means the railway undertakings, um, uh, have to give confidence to passengers to come back in public transport. Next slide, please. I give you uh, here uh, um, a slide which I've just received uh, concerning uh, the meeting of this afternoon in the presentation of Japan, Japan, Japan East Railway, GR East. And, and, and I like this presentation uh, because, uh, because they always say in all our meetings, okay, there are three things. There are masks, masks, 
you have to wash your hands and you have to respect distances. There are three things which are very important for uh, to avoid the contamination uh, between, between members. Mask is okay, but mask is not perfect measure. You can receive some virus in the eyes. You can, uh, there, was, there, is, there is also other measures which are necessary to give confidence to, uh, the, uh, to the customers. So thank you very much for that. Next slide, please. So it is my, my short presentation I, I wanted to share with you uh, in order to, uh, to, for you to ask your questions. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, there was a You're comment welcome. there from Milko. Um, just recognizing your, your members, your membership through, through Asia. And um, we're obviously very fortunate to have an organization such as yours being able to sort of, you know, bring together and coordinate um, the various, you know, responses that different um, countries are making. So I'll just pause for a quick moment and ask, are there any questions quickly for Mark before we ask Juan to, and we have, we have, we have one or two. So um, we might just deal with those quickly, quickly, Mark, if we could. Um, can you please elaborate and share some specific proactive actions taken to regain trust of the public in bringing them back to public transport. So wonderful question. I know that's probably one of our topics that we might deal with towards the end, but do you have any sort of immediate, um, any immediate thoughts? Yes, to, 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 to give confidence to the passengers. Mm. Yes. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, for passengers, there are two kinds of passengers. There are passengers for mass transit passengers, and maybe after that, maybe Juan will speak about that. Uh, for, for mass transit, for commuters, for regional passengers, and there are also passengers for intercity and high speed trains. For what wants the, the, the public? The public wants not to be contaminated. That means there are protections against others. We spoke, I spoke about masks, about distanciation, about um, be sure that uh, there is no other passenger which has fever. But there are also to, to give the confidence, also what will be the maintenance of the stations and the rolling stock in the materials to be sure that the stations or the trains are not contaminated. That means there are cleaning protocols in trains and in stations. For cleaning protocols, uh, there are a lot of, um, of different uh, experience in, the, um, uh, in our members. Uh, if I take Greece, for example, in Greece, uh, there, there are cleaning staff within the train. There are, um, uh, in, uh, in Spain, they are cleaning the trains two, two, two times a day. In others, they are cleaning the trains in all the terminals when the trains are arriving at the, at the end, of, end, end of the trip. Mm. So it depends in the, the protocol depends on the on the, the company. Yeah. Uh, there are also um, to uh, we have also to avoid the peaks, the peaks and the crowds. And for, for that, there is a mix between the decisions of the railway undertakings of the industry and of the government. Uh, to avoid the peaks. Uh, it is first to um, ensure the teleworking experience we have today, mm. and it works. Nobody, uh, two months ago, nobody will say, okay, it will work, the teleworking, but it works, and the companies continue to, to, to work with teleworking and, and video conference. It is my case. Um, uh, and, and also, um, uh, uh, in the stations, uh, it is important yeah. also to uh, to avoid some flows which are crossing flows in stations. So the organization of stations has, has to be different uh, within within uh, within that. For intercity, if I can continue one minute for intercity yep. and yeah. high speed and high speed uh, services, of course, to give the confidence is to manage the booking seats to redesign maybe the seat layout of the trains, 
and, and also we have to be very careful of the shift to rail trends. Uh, there is a recent study, I have seen that by a, Swiss, a Switzerland bank, a Swiss bank, UBS, which expects an acceleration in passenger shift from trends to high speed rail in Europe and in China due to this, due to this pandemic. So we have to be very well prepared for that because maybe we will have more passengers uh, in, in rail. Thank you for this question. Fabulous. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there's a good number of questions coming, coming through. So, Mark, I might ask you to look at the Q&A and there might be some there that you could perhaps type an answer to, um, to, to, to help with. Um, I'd like now to hand over to Juan Alfonso, who's going to give us um, you know, the view and perspective of the, of the private operator around a major um, transit um, network. So, Juan, I'll hand over to you. Hi, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks for joining this, this uh, webinar. Um, my name is Juan Alfonso. I am the president and CEO of Light Rail Manila Corporation. We are the private operator of LRT uh, Line 1 in uh, Manila, in the Philippines. And uh, the presentation this afternoon is just a quick walkthrough of uh, almost a look back on what happened to us last month no? prior to uh, the escalation of this entire pandemic. Um, next slide, please. So with the pandemic action plan, one of the things we, we were talking about is how do you, how do you prepare for something like this? No? And I think Mark uh, mentioned that they set up a group. Um, our company, um, we set up a crisis management team and that was really a crisis management team for, for the sake of business continuity. You know? Our risk management, uh, uh, our risk management committee asked us to set that up. And, and with the protocols of our crisis management team, um, we assembled this group to face, uh, you know, what what we saw as the as the uh, as the COVID nineteen pandemic that was that was escalating. Um, there were different stages on the on the pandemic alert levels, and um, I think that the group started meeting and planning as soon as um, the government uh, number one raised the the alert levels, and second. Um, we also started looking at our, our, our crisis management plans and seeing which ones were applicable for this type of pandemic. Uh, we had to, I guess, like everyone, read as much as we could about it and, uh, and then adjust to it. And then our different departments as well had several scenarios or planning on what to do next. You know? uh, what to do with reduced level of service, what to do with uh, uh, potentially a shutdown, you know, which is which is where we are right now. The government uh, shut down all, uh, pretty much quarantined the whole city of Manila from uh, March, uh, I believe this March 13th or 14th, and this will end on April 30th. No, uh, another couple of weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So um, just sharing what we did. Now, we had several schedules. Uh, sorry, uh, one slide up, please. Okay. So uh, sharing what we did, we looked, uh, as we mentioned, we looked at maybe looking at the reduced level of service. And one way um, we did this, we did this, um, made this adjustment quicker was to look at, uh, you know, weekend schedules or holiday schedules. No? Um, we were anticipating reduced ridership. So from 28 trains, we went down to look at our schedules of about 26 trains or 22 trains. Um, and um, I, think, I think the whole 
throughout this presentation, you're going to see that the critical, the critical um, factor is really communication. Communication to your team, number one, and communication to your passengers. So the reduced level of service was communicated uh, to both teams now when, when, when we thought that was, that was imminent. And then with the, with the pandemic um, supply, with the, with the pandemic um, really, you know, uh, in everybody's minds, we took, we, took, uh, we took the step of providing alcohol, soap, and masks to, to each of the team members. No? So all of, our, all of our team members, drivers, uh, tellers, operations people, uh, were given masks, uh, two masks, one so that they could wash. Uh, they they had they'd want to wash and want to wear. No? Um, there there was a shortage immediately of surgical masks, and and our our approach was to was to give them cloth masks. No, at least they had something at at this time. Um, with regards to uh, disinfection of trains, I think there was a question earlier. Um, we 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 started disinfecting the trains after every 30 minutes or after pretty much every every loop. Um, at the end of uh, once one loop uh, at, at the end station, we had specific cleaners who would come into the trains and and disinfect you know, uh, roughly every 30 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, also, we, we had invested in, in some intercom systems with the cashiers. Uh, we still have, have about uh, most of our tickets that are sold at the stations. Um, so we had intercom systems to, to reduce the contact and really also asking people to, to purchase the, the cards electronically you know, with some of the machines available to reduce the contract, contact with passengers. And then like many establishments, we also did health screening, um, which are really temperature checks. No? And uh, I think at least in, in, in our offices, we had travel declarations. So anybody who had been to the countries uh, that were affected at that time, um, uh, we asked them to declare those. And I think the action was to follow the regulation of doing a quarantine for some of those people who had traveled and been away. Uh, the, the, the committee also had an emergency response team. Um, the, the, that photo below of that group that uh, disinfects certain areas. Um, we had some cases of uh, some persons who were suspected of having this disease. So when we have that information, this team comes in and disinfects that entire area um, and, and, and cleans it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, again, th throughout throughout this journey, I think what we're, we've been doing is is trying to communicate um, with our passengers what we've been doing, uh, cleaning the trains every thirty minutes, and using a lot of social media as well to to tell them that we're doing uh, we're we're exerting our efforts to to make sure that they're safe. No, uh, right before uh, we we did operations for about uh, about. Uh, I, about one week uh, before we were shut down with social distancing and we had uh, really our operations team load up the trains uh, to only 25 percent of, of the of the typical load um, so on the passenger side that that's how we managed it on the uh, on the on the office um, the photo below is is the photo of our cafeteria where uh, we've asked, you know, our, our team members to have lunch, for example, and not congregate and, and really have lunch uh, in one seat or table. So, uh, that's number one. And then, and then second also is to stagger the, stagger the hours in which they have lunch so that it's not a big, big number of people uh, congregate, congregating. Um, and I think some of some of these suggestions we had received from uh you know some of the consultation also we are uh, lrmc is part of uitp uh, which is part of mark's uh, group and we had uh we had some consultation with the different operators on what they were doing 
and some of those suggestions came through on, on that part. But on the social distancing, that was really um, also the government who, who mandated that. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the, the other critical part uh, is really is really managing the employees. No, um, I think Mark had mentioned this, and 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 you'll hear a lot of this. People who are doing uh, work from home arrangements and skeletal forces using teleconference um, facilities, no, to to just decrease the number of people who who are uh, who are at the stations or at at the offices, and and. And, and allow them to, you know, to be to be less susceptible to to catching catching this uh, this virus. The other thing we did is also we we uh, we paid we continued to pay all of our employees uh, since May May the fifteenth, um, and we'll continue paying them up to the April thirtieth up to the end of the quarantine period. And we did, and, and some of these people uh, have received also their mid-year bonus, uh, which is which is given out in June. We, we we forwarded it because we anticipated that a lot of them would not have income at this time. Also, we had emergency loan facilities for medicines, uh, and just a general financial support loan to to help tidy them up. So, um, there are also going to be families that are looking after them in terms of uh, some support at this time. Next slide, please. In terms of our employee communications, it's really through you know digital and a lot of the uh, traditional uh, notices that we have, um, and and a lot of it is a communication. It, it's it's learning learning about what the COVID pandemic is, how how can you catch it, what the company is doing for them, um, cleaning and and how are how we're willing to support them. In terms of giving them um, PPE to 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 do their work, no? especially our frontliners. Uh, next slide, please. And then we we pretty much came up with uh, a regular series of bulletins. The head of our uh, crisis management team and our head head of safety uh, provided this, and we had a and we have a dashboard that we show all of the employees every every two days now. Uh, of of the persons uh, who possibly have this um, virus and 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 the monitoring and so forth, because we want it to be transparent and also show them uh, that the company supports them now if if they get into this in, into this uh, difficulty. And also, if there are any issues or any sus suspected cases, our our uh, quick response team uh, goes into their areas and cleans these out. No? Just so that everybody else who, who still goes to the office uh, stays safe. Um, next slide, please. And and I think the next the next uh, stage is really how how to get back to to operations once quarantines are lifted. Um, we're expecting from some of from from some of the members, the other members of uh, the different transport groups we spoke to. Some of them had had uh, re uh, volume of about 50% or some even 30% of the, of the volumes they had before the, the COVID-19. And it really makes you think about how, you know, how many people would you have on staff at that time? Uh, what type of skeletal force uh, and what type of continuity for disinfectation, disinfection of facilities? And, uh, and and continued communication. No? Um, one other thing I'd like to uh, point that I bring out is a lot of one of the things that we we've, we've learned is that uh, a lot of the critical employees, uh, so, uh, a lot of companies isolate the critical employees. No, um, one one company identified them, for example, even on the support side as the, as the people who perform the payroll, so that people get paid every every time. No? So these people were separated in terms of their desks, even in terms of uh, uh, going to the to the cafeterias or where they eat, and and, and so on and so forth. So that type of planning, um, and then, and then again, customer advisories to the customers so that they know what to expect. Some of the members, uh, the other members or the other organizations, uh, implemented a no mask, no entry policy. 
and uh, we're probably going to implement that as well. Um, several cities here already are implementing no mask, uh, uh, no, no going around or no, no leaving your house without any no mask. No? So something that we were, we're going to implement. But again, these have to be communicated. Um, and then last on the how, how, you, how do you rebuild the, the confidence is that I think you have, to, you have to mention to the customers what you do. If you disinfect the trains every 30 minutes, then you have to mention that. Uh, provide, for example, uh, masks to the team members or to the train drivers or even the cleaning materials. So, um, we're looking at doing our, our health and safety department is looking at even doing maybe ultraviolet um, disinfection for the trains, no? something we're studying and maybe doing uh, disinfection tents, uh, just, just so that you know, people feel safe while they're in the, in the trains and, and uh, there. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Andy. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Juan. That was a fabulous insight and I think shows uh, importance of communication, communicating to our Juan, there's a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, I really like this one from, uh, I think it's at Nazul. Um, and you know, one of the emerging issues that we're um, grappling with is the concept of con contactless technology. And the question here is, what is your opinion in using a scan QR code to get a ticket instead of using a physical ticket, which obviously has the, uh, you know, concerns around who else may have handled um, that material. Has that been something that you've given any thought, um, any thought to? Yes, we're actually in the process of uh, migrating to the QR technology. It, it just, uh, I think we had anticipated going to it next year, no? but unfortunately we're not in a position to do that uh, immediately. But yes, it's something that we're that that we're on our way to doing. Excellent. Um, Mark, for for you, is that um, the contactless technology where you know um, we have to handle less things? Is that something that any of your members are actively are actively looking at as well? Yes, yeah, yes, of course. Uh, but 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 it depends on our members. Uh, there's our members who we do not use paper, paper, paper tickets. So for them, it's, it's not, it, it is, uh, uh, it is simple to, 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 to change, uh, to change their behavior. There are members which are using both paper tickets and electronic tickets. So for them, they do not sell anymore any paper tickets and, and the ticket and the vending uh, machines and the ticket offices are closed in their countries. We have members, and like, like in ASEAN also, where there are only, sometimes only paper tickets. So for, 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 for them, I, th I think Juan has a, the, the best answer for that. Yeah, very good. Thank you. So there's a couple of themes sort of emerging from the, from the, from the question and, and answer, and I guess probably one of the top of mind ones is how quickly do each of you um, believe that your traffic, you know, your usage and your patronage will return back to his, you know, the, the, the levels it was um, two or three months ago? Do you have a feel for how quickly that might um, eventuate? Uh, Mark, maybe start with you and then Juan. Yeah, yes, do you, have, do you have with you a crystal ball, yes? Exactly. <laughs> 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 so, so it is. It is quite my answer. Uh, you know that that all the countries are not in the same stage of the pandemic issue. Even in, in Europe, even in Europe, that Italy beca began one month before France for that. So, for uh, for international traffic, it is complicated to resume uh, the traffic in um, uh, in in some months. We we, we do not know. We do not know. What, what we have to do to resume the traffic is to give confidence to the customers and to give to confidence to the staff, to the staff which is directly in contact with the customers. 
So we, 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 with that, it, it is the basis. Without that, no, 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 nothing will work. And after that, after that, there, there will be, of course, a situation which will never, when I say never, in the six next months, never be uh, la like it was six months ago. Mm. Never, never. So, so that, that means that there will be some, some costs for the companies. For example, if there were only one person per row in the, in the high speed trends, that means you will lose traffic and you will lose uh, business, you will lose money. So how to cope with that? So we need, we need for that uh, a strong support of, of the governments uh, in, in all the countries for this period until there will be maybe a vaccine at the end of this year. And Juan, from from your perspective, how how quickly do you think um, things might return to what they were? What do you think are the two or three key factors that are going to um, determine that? We're in 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 our in our uh, I think projections. We're projecting that uh, we're going to have about thirty percent, thirty to fifty percent of the traffic in the next quarter and then build up to maybe getting that traffic back uh, towards the end of the year and hopefully get into a normal uh, pre-COVID ridership uh, beforehand. Factors that would affect that is a lot of it would, would also be government action per country. Um, our government is asking us to, to take the social distancing uh, Seriously, um, Mark had mentioned it. Uh, for example, in the trains, there are markers on seats that you you cannot sit on, or even on the on the floors areas where you can stand. So you're not going to have these situations where the trains are rush hour, uh, very very completely full trains. No, um, that is probably you know six months away if i think if we're lucky you know, or, or probably towards the end of the year um i think that's 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 a big driver to that um second is, is also the communication which which was already mentioned i think the more we communicate and the more the passengers feel that at least within within our transport system uh we operate uh clean and uh, we have our best practices in place to sanitize, whether it's by alcohol or UV or cleaning materials, um, or even the use of masks, no, um, that, that people are safe. Uh, I, think, I think in, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, with, the, with the SARS experience, people, a lot of the passengers already are wearing the masks and it became commonplace. No? So, that brought some of the traffic back to 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 them. Uh, I think it's I think it's a communication. I think it's a government, and uh, you know I guess I guess these the issue on the vaccine is 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 an outside factor that's not really in our control now. But mm. one thing that you can control is I think communication and uh, the service that you give at this point. Um. Mark, you might have some, you know, your, your members um, obviously also carry freight. You might have some insights into the freight sector um, as well. We've talked a lot about passenger um, services. Do you have some sort of reflections um, as to how it's affecting freight? I know in Australia, we're seeing uh, an uptick in, in the amount of freight that is being moved um, is being moved around to keep supermarkets and all those things um, well stocked. Uh, what, what are some of your members telling you about the freight? Um, yes, con the freight con con yes, thank you, Andrew, for this question. Concerning freight, freight is not at all at the same situation of passenger issues. So for freight, freight now is uh, running, but is running with with with, uh, with, with some goods which uh, they, they, they can uh, uh, they, they can transport. For uh, relatively to the COVID nineteen for freight. Uh, there are uh, two, um, two main actions. First is an action concerning the drivers. Uh, so drivers in Europe uh, cannot stay in the, in the machine, in the locomotive. 
they cannot cross borders sometimes not all of them but sometimes so so, so we have to organize the freight service with a um, uh, change of driver at the border it is, it is one of the uh, this uh, this topic so, second one is when you change driver you have to clean the locomotive so cleaning locomotive is, is also an, an issue at the border and also an issue at the beginning of the, the train when the train starts. So cleaning and disinfecting the locomotives uh, for that. And, and after that, there are regulations. So, so we have to, to, to think about, uh, about what are the regulations between the countries if the, we are allowed to transport this material from one country to another country. So it, it, it is a question of regulation. I, I, I think it's that. So freight has not reduced a lot like passenger. In passenger, so in some countries there is zero traffic. In some countries, most of the countries in Europe have between five to 10% of traffic. When I say traffic, it's trends. It's trends uh, and, and the uh, occupancy rate in trends is very low is normally less than 10% in, in, in Europe. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, I have seen a question coming, coming from, from China here. Um, uh, when do you forecast is Hontia? They said that. <laughs> when do you forecast the traffic public in your zone will be back to normal? I, I think they can give us, uh, and they will give us, because it will also part of our discussion this afternoon, they will give us how they manage now to recover the, to recover the situation after the pandemics. Okay, they, they, they will tell us and we will put that in the second or third, um, the third document in UIC. Excellent. All right, thank you. So we have about sort of 10 or so minutes left. Um, I'll ha I have one more question for, for, for both of you. I'll give you a bit of a heads up on the last question. Very keen. Um, that we ask you both, has there been anything out of this crisis um, pandemic that has really taken you by surprise? You know, a, a completely unforeseen um, um, eventuality of it. So we might have that as our sort of last question as we um, move towards um, wrapping up. But the other sort of major theme that's coming across the question and answer is about the future viability of um, you know, rail projects, um, rail infrastructure projects. And I might just ask that a different way. Um, any advice that either of you would have for any governments or um, construction companies that are in that sort of planning and engineering stage about, well, what, would, could, what could you do to accommodate um, this type of event in the future? Um, so maybe if Juan might start with you, any advice for, for people who might be you know, opening new, new systems in the next sort of five to 10 years? Well, we're, we're, we're building a, a line extension right now, no? uh, another 10 kilometers uh, south. Um, and I think the difficulty with this type of pandemic is that uh, it changes a lot of your assumptions, no? a lot of yeah. your traffic, your business cases for developing or investing systems are based on a traffic study that you bring to the bank or the government brings to the bank. And on that basis, you have your capex and your, and your profitability figures. So, um, depending on how this changes the riding patterns and how long those will change, those will definitely affect your your returns. Um, I would, I if, if if I was an investor and I I was looking to do a project, I I I'd, I'd be waiting uh, for some clarity in the market to see how this pans out, so that you know if if uh, if if this if this lasts for for a longer period than than we think it will, which is the next year or the next 18 months, some people are saying, then, then that throws the investment cases uh, out the window for, for some of these projects, you know, mm. um, particularly in the, rail, in the rail sector where it's, it's quite capital intensive yeah. and, and long uh, lead times for doing projects. Um, 
I, I, I think for, for the for the for the light rail or, or the metro uh, uh, lines, I think I think Mark had mentioned something for probably country to country travel on on the high speed rail that may may be different, no? where people are shifting from from airplanes to mm -hmm. to uh, to long 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 haul or high speed rail. No? But on the on the on the on the urban or the on the light rail or the metro systems. Um, it really raises more questions for us than, than answers at this point. So yeah. I think a lot of people will 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 stop and and really uh, wait for the for for some clarity, probably the next six months or or longer, and and see if these projects still make sense at this time. No? Mark, your 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 thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, advice, maybe it's, uh, it's not uh, the, the right word because I will not advise governments for that. But <laughs> it is it is one one of our role to 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 share uh, what uh, what are doing um, the, the the members. Well, I I, I think there there will be uh, four four main uh, consequences for 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 new projects. Uh, first, uh, there are consequences on railway stations, on trains, on operation, and on financing. Uh, for for railway stations, I think there are advices here. Uh, the main impacts are for uh, for waiting areas for lounge. So so uh, we have to to think on how to um, design this this uh, this ways. Uh, in ticket office also uh, because because maybe they will not exist anymore in some countries or how to do that and to integrate the web ticketing. What will be very important, I think, within, within railway stations in the passenger flows uh, to all the part of stations between between shops, between ticket office, between waiting areas with with uh, with platforms, passenger flows have to be very carefully um, uh, thought uh, in the in the stations. Avoid crossing of passenger, avoid crossing passenger and staff, uh, and also other users of stations which are not passenger and staff. And also the access of the train, of course, mm -hmm. and the intermodality, and maybe maybe it is a link with 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 Juan intermodality to go to other transport modes. So everything has to be racing now for the new project and new actions. Mm -hmm. For the trains, for the trains, um, the, the the question will be also the occupancy rate of the train. For, but, but we have to be careful about uh, about the cleaning of the trains. The trains for new trends have to be easy to clean. And mm. also uh, uh, there are uh, questions concerning the materials. And maybe it is now a challenge for the manufacturers to select the right materials uh, which are su suitable for heavy cleaning and also for disinfection. Uh, in the trends there are also the luggage areas. Uh, we have to think about that. We, don't, we do not have any answer. And the other services like in restaurants, uh, in bars, and also entertainments. So it is okay. I, I speak more with, with, with long, uh, long, long traffic with intercity, and uh, it is more our business. Yeah, excellent. Uh, it's a great point about the manufacturers um, and that ease of cleaning this. You know, they sort of that practical. Um, um, sort of piece there is, uh, you know, it's um, excellent. So as I said, I'll sort of now start to, to wrap up the, the, the session. We've had, um, I think, upwards of about 200 odd, uh, 220 odd people um, listen in, which is fabulous um, to, your, to your insights. But with events like these, which are, you know, very unforeseen, um, you know, Juan, you indicated that there had been a lot of sort of crisis planning in, in place. Um, but I would be very interested to, to hear from both of you. Has there anything that has, has really taken you by surprise? You know, that sort of very unforeseen um, um, event. And maybe if we could sort of conclude on, on that um, um, question, that would be, that would be yeah. wonderful. So maybe Mark, what, what, what's really, you know, sort of taken you by surprise? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, first, uh, 
the great reactivity of the operators. I was very surprised uh, about that. They are adapting uh, all the, with, with the new situation and cooperating between themselves. And we see that mm -hmm. in UIC. Even there are competitors in the real life. They are um, they are cooperating in that uh, in that topic, and with a great reactivity. W what was surprised also for me is I was so surprised to have shut down of entire traffic in some countries. Mm. We, we, we when uh, if we say that uh, one uh, one uh, one year ago we say okay you are crazy it's not possible it's it's. Uh, <laughs> Very impossible. So we have India, uh, Kazakhstan, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and other countries. Uh, and what was also surprising is th that we can work in teleworking. It works, yeah. and when web conferences, it works. It's the <laughs> same. One one year ago, I will say, in my position, for example, I will give my position of passenger director. Each week, I have I, 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 tra I travel to to foreign countries. So today it is not the case, but the work is the same. The work is done. There were, there were the same, same number of meetings, same number of conferences, and, and it worked. Of course, we need also to meet our partners, and, and, but, 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 but uh, in this kind of situation, it, it worked. Okay, it is my... Fair, fabulous. Thank you very much. Juan, what, what, what's, what's really taken you by surprise? Well, I think what, what took us by surprise is, is really the speed at which, you know, the events unfolded and, and changed. Um, I think none of us thought that this would, a year ago, that this, something like this would be possible, not that the entire system would be shut down. Um, that's uh, something that's been talked about already. But I think the, I think, um, I think on the flip side to that, uh, I think we're seeing. I, I think we're seeing our teams adapt and cooperate, and make things happen and work uh, in this type of environment. The work doesn't stop, and I think that's possible with with. I think the kind of the kind of team you try to put together in your organization. Our 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 teams are still there, uh, doing maintenance work on our on our on our trains and on our systems. And all of our support departments are still working and helping people. You know, our, our safety teams are still looking at, you know, the better ways to do uh, all of this disinfection. And in between that is, you know, we're, we're trying to help as well um, our, our countries, our cities in, in whichever way, you know. Um, we have, we have uh, we're providing some fleet transport. Uh, we've got some 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 shuttle shuttle services that we're providing to to the hospitals and to the nurses who are on the front lines. So I guess it's it's it also shows um, you know despite everything we're we're trying to give back and you know I guess our human side that when when things are 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 in this type of situation we try to help each other out no matter what we have. Yeah. Um, so I think I think that's that's the quick answer. Yeah. No, fabulous. The, the, the response, um, the collaboration, um, yeah, has been remarkable to the, to the, to the event. So we're right on 6, 6.30. Um, I believe Bastian would like to close out with a couple of comments um, to participants. But on behalf of um, Mark and, 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 and Juan, I'd like to thank everyone for joining in uh, the questions and the commentary um that we've had has been very very insightful and um and thank you for taking the time to join and obviously mark and juan thank you very much for your insights and taking the time out of what is you know, an extremely busy period so maybe uh to bastian um over to you to to close out thank you thank you so much andrew i really appreciate uh, the great session thank you mark thank you juan i really appreciate your your insights and and the valuable lessons that hopefully um we as, as viewers and the other attendees uh, will have been able to learn, uh, learn something from. So thank you all. That's very good. Um, before we close off the session, uh, I just wanted to uh, point out our next 
uh, next week uh, is going to be uh, provided by Andrea uh, Guritin. Uh, he will be speaking on uh, high speed, how restarting your operations post COVID-19. Uh, so hopefully everybody will tune in again uh, next week. Um, thank you everybody for uh, coming to the session. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay inside and uh, hopefully until next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.